You are listening to Cut the Cord Radio. Mike Bishop is in the studio. Uh, he made the trek. Where were you at just now? Uh, I was at uh, Guar rehearsal. Oh, really? Yeah. How's that yeah. going? Um, it's going well, man. It's a uh, a very different experience. I bet. Right before I left, I was like, "So, is there anything I'm doing that you would like for me to do differently?" <laughs> <laughs> that was my I mind. wonder if anyone ever asked that in Guar. It doesn't really seem like like that would be a normal conversation in Guar. I I think that you know it hasn't been maybe, but you know I'm a different sort of guy, so sure. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. I was curious, you know. I'm, it's a it's a big thing to do, and I wanted to know what they thought. So because we just been so it's kind of running in front of it and rehearsing a lot. Yeah, so, um, totally. But uh, I I just asked them and they were like no it sounds great and so I was like okay cool and then maybe uh, <clears throat> you know the the biggest hardest part of that is really that that there are so many lyrics sure so like his Dave wrote like I mean it, you know a typical Keepone song would have I mean, I've never written a song that had more than two printed pages of lyrics ever writing lyrics is the worst. Well, for, I, I I never I always had to write lyrics for my band, and I just like fucking, I did it at the absolute last minute, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, but I I mean I I just you know I I I always liked singers who made a lot out of just a few words, you know, like Iggy Pop and stuff like that. Um, but Brocky, man, he was a long lyric writing guy, like you know, and he, <laughs> and he just. And not a big self editor, <laughs> so there's like just a ton of lyrics. Like every single song has three printed pages of lyrics. Right. So, Whoa. Was there ever? Is there a song that like you know were all the lyrics preserved somehow after Dave's death, or or were they all just in like inside the booklets, or did you have to go back and find old songs? I just listened to them, and then um, you know with the internet, I mean I pulled them off. I got the lyrics online. Um, and then some of them, I, if, you know, the, they were clearly wrong. So, I mean, it's the same, it's actually the same procedure that I use for learning lyrics for my soul cover band, <laughs> the Misery <laughs> Brothers, like, you know, and, and uh, the whole project is very much like that. Like I just get, find the lyrics online, then listen to the song, see where the lyrics are wrong because they invariably are wrong. Um, and then you know make the corrections and 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 then just learn them yeah. just you know rote memorization i um, mean not to bring a, obviously a bad subject but you know we're talking to uh mike bishop from guar uh dave brocky from guar of course passed away earlier this year which was probably one of the biggest bummers in music history um and in richmond yeah felt um, it real hard here I, I definitely it was a weird day it was a weird week mm -hmm. um and everybody was super bummed about it obviously but you were asked to to fill in for for Dave for Guarbecue. Was it always going to be that they were going to keep Guarbecue going, or did was there any inkling that maybe maybe we shouldn't do this? There was a you know I mean yeah there was a definitely a time period where everything I mean basically like there you know this wasn't in the books so when it happened everything that everybody did was new and by the seat of the pants and nobody. You know, I mean, unfortunately, the band had actually had experience with tragedy. Yeah, because um, yeah, that's so. You know, they they, you know, but I mean, those guys are trauma. I mean, there there's a lot. That's a lot of trauma. I'm sure for them. Yeah. Um, and the and you know, so immediately afterwards, I mean, no, yeah, nobody knew what to do or what was going to happen. There was definitely, it was definitely up in the air and. Uh, you know, we had a meeting, um, and I started going to the meetings um, because uh, I could tell that they needed some help. And um, I'm in a place right now in my life that's a pretty good place as far as, and, and so I thought I could help them. Sure. And so yeah. 
Um, Plus, you were a member of Guar. You know, I mean, I feel like everyone that's been in that band, I don't think there's any bad blood. It seems like most no. people that were in Guar stayed friends. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're totally friends. And, like, you know, it's just that, like, I felt this need to get close to them when this happened. And so I was there and we were hanging out. And I remember when, you know, it was the, the question was asked, what should we do? And everybody was like, he would probably want us to keep going. So, um, you know, unfortunately, he didn't make any sort of arrangements or anything. Yeah, like, it doesn't you know. sound like <laughs> yeah. he doesn't sound like the type of guy that's like, let me stop and write down exactly what I want. Yeah, he'll yeah, write three pages not. of lyrics, but he won't tell anyone <laughs> right. what he wants to be done. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah, in the event like, of his death. No, it, so so you know he he didn't do that, but but you know we we know because of things he said in interviews. Uh, and because of his plan for the band, you know, like it just in general from being around him, everybody knew and understood that he wanted to keep it going. Sure. Um, and the barbecue, it was like almost from the beginning, they were like, all right, well, we're going to keep doing, we're going to do barbecue because the fans will need that as a, you know, a kind of memorial. Um, so that was decided really quickly. Sure. Like, and, you it be, and, you, and Guar was like in the, planning phases of it already it had been oh yeah that set was, up and bands had yeah, already been booked yeah and, everything was yeah. done like there were deposits paid there were like all of the sort of business around barbecue it was all done and then you know that happened so uh or you know dave died so uh brad uh, and uh, the rest of the guys you know, Brad, I think, you know, he works really hard. The drummer, he works on uh, barbecue a lot. And he was, you know, yeah, man, we're just going to keep doing it. And so it, it it carried through on its own momentum. And then after that, they decided, you know, I, I got a phone call. I had no idea what they were going to do. Right. But because they were, <laughs> they like, decided, <laughs> well, they, they said, you know, we're going to we're going to play. And I remember the the meeting like, like who know, the fuck are they going to get? Well, well, they, they said, you know how how are we going to do it and uh, i was in that meeting and um then i rode home and like that I, it crossed my mind i was like you know i could probably do but the way it crossed my mind You're was a pretty this capable vocalist i mean i i, I would say <laughs> i mean he <laughs> uh, freaking awesome well, yeah. this is this is what i'm curious about when you do the vocals are you going on is there going to be two beefcakes on stage no, there's a new character. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's oh. not going to be two beefcakes. There, um, that's actually my, I mean, that was the first thing I thought. My yeah. original idea for it was, was so cool, and they're not going to do it. But say it because, now. Well, I, I yeah, just say it. Well, they wouldn't Go do on, it. man. You know, they want. You know, they, there's like they, they're kind of wanting it to be a little tougher than this. But my idea was because I. That's my character. Beefcake was my character. It yes. was my name before I was in Guar was right. Beefcake. So I wanted to have like Beefcake actually go through this sort of metamorphosis where he experienced mitosis. Like he actually divided <laughs> on stage. <laughs> and I was going to be but and and they might have gone with that except that my idea was that I would have to be naked. So I'd like like he'd, he'd be wiggling around and then I'd come out from behind him nude. <laughs> oh my yes. god! And like you know, and that's and that's worth every big penny. Beef and right? little yeah, beef, yeah. Man. And then I would have to like get my costume, like a new. I'd be this new character. <laughs> right, right. That was my idea. And <laughs> I think it's fabulous. That's great. It is. It, well, you know, we might be able to do something with that in the future. But yeah, I mean, I was riding. I was riding down the road uh, in Charlottesville, and we hadn't even moved yet. So that means that I mean, it was shit like march 25th or something or it was pretty soon after no it had to have been after um I, I don't know it's some i just got a phone call it was like maybe a couple weeks after he died and uh matt and um and uh the new guitar player i guess he's, well, he's new to me but brent um perguson called and we're like do you want to do this do you want to sing and uh it hadn't it had crossed my mind, but but only in the sense that I thought, well, I can do. There's like four songs that I can sing sure. because I sang them anyway, and then we could get characters to do the rest of the songs because you could do, Executioner song, you could do Sly Minister song, you could do the song that Dirk sang, the song you know, like, and you could put a set together out of all these characters. Right. That's what I thought they were gonna do, but then they asked me to do. Like you know, to just kind of fill in, right? To do songs that, right? The, the, the hit, not the hits, yeah. but I was surprised. No, the, yeah, the non the hits. <laughs> Play all the you know. Yeah. But it was a powerful moment because I, I, 
they asked me and I was I went, I was on my way to Kroger in Charlottesville and I walked in and I was just like and I just had this incredible sense that Brocky I was kind of angry because I was like you know I quit right and for you a quit, reason you quit golf I, yeah war. I quit mm-hmm. for a reason because I didn't want to do it anymore right, right? and like <laughs> it must be then, it must be then, a traumatic experience yeah, well, to be in choir <laughs> and then and then Brocky like from beyond the grave like sucks me back in which is what he always wanted to do anyway right. so I'm like god you know you fucking so you know but but it was i just kind of i knew i just had a feeling come over me that i could i felt that it was something that he wanted me to do sure so i told him yes that's Mm -hmm. crazy so then you start rehearsing you're back in guar does i i've always wondered this about guar do you guys do rehearsal in your outfits to like get used to that shit some yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean man because i couldn't imagine i played in a band and i was a total bitch i would have never made it through a guar set with all just the stuff on the amount of of energy just to play is enough let alone to have you know what like 10 it's 15. a lot of stuff it's a lot of a lot of gear i've asked i asked uh brad about that one time i was like dude you're playing drums at outdoor festivals with all this shit on he's like yeah man you know gets to a point you're just like you're so hot you just kind of your muscles get lubed up and you just get used to it and i'm like <laughs> it sounds like you're describing a heat stroke man yeah. like i don't think that's healthy <laughs> No, I mean, I and I'm, I'm I'm worried about that. I have to. I'm gonna. I've, I've been walking and starting a program to try and get in a little bit better shape. Maybe not by barbecue, but certainly <laughs> by the time the tour comes shape out. Shape up comes for barbecue. So you're, you're you're gonna do a, a full tour. Yeah, yeah, we're doing a tour. Wow, how that's, many dates is that? Uh, it's a lot. I mean, it's like eight weeks. You know. Um pretty much playing all the time right so you know is this I mean, so it's official that you are a permanent member or is it just no, for this 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 tour i mean we're just taking it like sort of obligation by obligation right, right. like and and the tour that was uh already kind of in the works so they're going to keep doing that and it's going to be a kind of i mean you know we've set it up so that the character that I have is, uh, you know, it, it's transitional. I mean, if they want to, we're just leaving it open. Like, right. you know, if they want to get someone else or if they, you know, I, and that's the other thing is that I, I, you know, I'm also at a place in my life where like that really wouldn't bother me. Right. You know, like, yeah. you know, and I think that's <laughs> that. So it might be important that, you know, for some people, like they might be possessive of the gig. I honestly, I would love to do it if I can, but you know, I mean, I've got a great job. I like what I'm doing. I like the music that I make. Otherwise, so if I do do it, if we decide that I'll do it, then that's awesome. Uh, if not, that's cool too. So, so. Your, yeah. you, your main that's gig awesome. now is the the Misery Brothers, right? <laughs> My main gig um, that I do regularly is still pro- actually Sarah White. I mean, that's the 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 act that I play with the most. Okay. Um, and uh, Sarah White and the Pearls, and it's just. Uh, you know she's uh that that's that's what i do the most i i think I, certainly that that was my main connection to music and then i started doing the misery brothers misery brothers have only played a few times but yeah i wanted to make you know it's a it's a cover band that we were kind of trying to you know we're also sort of working in some originals right and eventually we would like work through all of the covers and it would just be you know mostly originals and um I've never done a band like that. Like I always just did, you know, it's funny cause you know, I went to play when I started playing in Charlottesville and there aren't a lot of musicians that play heavy music and I couldn't find anybody to play with. Right. I'm not, I feel like that might happen as you get older, you know, it's yeah. harder to find people that want to play heavy music. Charlottesville is yeah. not known for fucking shredding music. No. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah. last time I checked, it was like Dave Matthews, Bruce Hornsby style, you know, yeah chilling yeah nothing wrong with that but it's more of the vibe well i mean sarah like you know i found i mean sarah sarah's music uh stood out i mean it, i i went towards doing that uh at the time i was playing with tom peloso um in uh this thing called the virginia sheiks that he had which was basically him just sort of doing his uh um his solo work like outside of Modest Mouse and and it was um 
that was a fun band, but it, it didn't really uh, pan out. Um, you know, he didn't wind up doing very much with it. Um, but we had a gig where we played with Sarah, and I just watched it and watched her do the, do it solo, and I listened to her records, and I was like, this is the closest thing that I could find to the attitude and the ethic of music that I was familiar with. Sure. Like, you know, because she has a very sort of uh, punk rock um, you know, even though her music, it's it's pretty much it's like it's a cross between folk and uh, punk. But I mean, I, you know, I, there, there's definitely sort of some like violent films, gun club aspects to that's it. Awesome. You know? yeah. So like that's and that that's that's what attracted me to it. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was fun. I mean, and these days, man, like, you know, in heavy music. Honestly, I mean, from, well, from what I've been, well, from, <laughs> come on, man, for heavy bass music players, right now, I think is in a, a lull. I don't. I'm not saying there's bad bands right now. I'm just saying that compared to like when Keypone was playing in like the early '90s, the mid '90s, it was like Helmet and I mean these like yeah. really heavy, awesome, intricate bands that also had a punk edge to you know right it was just a, i just feel like the music of that time stands out more than what's going on right now maybe that's me being an asshole though. it's definitely true that what one thing that i've noticed is that if you you know it's kind of like when i came back and started playing bass again and started paying attention to what was out there like the metal bass or and hard rock bass you can't hear it ever and it's not it doesn't seem very important in the music anymore. right right yeah, for sure and that wasn't my experience of heavy metal my experience of heavy metal was that bass was very important sure, and yeah. like and it the is, bands it were super important yeah and it when they were bass driven like you know i mean i learned how to play by imi imitating uh uh um steve harris from iron maiden yeah. and like and the, you know he was my favorite player so i learned all of every maiden song that i could learn that's how i learned how to play and you know to me like now I, the the good bass players to me sound like they're in pop music right that's yeah. that you know so i don't want to play like the root note of some dildo guitarist like you know <laughs> I mean, so i'm not gonna do that i'm in like a room full of bass players right <laughs> yeah now. i know right? i'm well, the dildo guitarist <laughs> man, I'm, a, I'm a dildo guitarist too but i mean like bass you should play bass like you play but play, play bass you can play fist son i remember yeah. i remember <laughs> play like guitar son <laughs> play bass, on, <laughs> no no seriously though uh i learned, dude mike is one of i think the most unique bass player definitely in richmond this area but man like in like heavy music in the like probably the past ten years. Like personally, you know, dude, he's a good bass player. But sure, the thing isn't about like he's got. I mean, yeah, he's got good time and stuff, and a lot of people do. But it's more of like, oh, I like the way this guy is approaching it. Like you know, uh, he it's cool, man. He does the whole, the whole like just balls out thing with the finger like the muting with the finger that shit's weird you're I never saw playing, it you're not I, playing with a pick right no, no. no but I mean like he's playing and he's playing with his fingers a lot of people play bass with their fingers but sure. he did some shit I was like wow that's that that's really weird like I don't know where that came from but it's, I, I it's pretty cool and you don't you don't I don't in music now that still happens where I see people I'm like oh man I really dig that but it doesn't happen as often as I feel like it did from other eras and other periods of time. I don't know if it's because I'm more jaded now. I've like seen more stuff, but it I'm just, just seems thinking like of it like doesn't every, happen. Every band from the '90s had a, that was awesome. Always had a really kick-ass rhythm section. Yeah. I and mean, you had Kurt. <laughs> I mean, Nirvana would not be Nirvana without fucking Chris Novoselic or fucking Primus, obviously. Or mm -hmm. Helmet was very bass heavy. Right. Uh, Jane's Addiction was really bass heavy. All that stuff. Dude, even 90s. like Flea, you know. Flea is yeah, awesome. Yeah. Man. I, I mean, mean, all good bands have good rhythm sections. I though. know. <laughs> that's basically, you kind of, yeah. you can't, that's the one thing like your guitar player, your singer can kind of like, not. You know, they can kind of be lackluster. Right. And you can get by. But if your drummer and your bass player suck, like, it's horrible. <laughs> like, Dude, I, can't... I think the worst, the most unnerving thing is mixing a band where the bass player and the drummer are really bad. I like, just I think in metal uh, though, in metal the bass is kind of falling through the cracks. At yeah, least that's what it looks sure. like to me. It's like they have really fancy drummers who can do a lot of stuff, um, and then they have uh, guitar players that are awesome, and the bass you can't hear it, and that just bums me out. Like, <laughs> I mean, especially bums me out when I go see somebody and you and the bass player is playing through like two. Mesa Boogie 400 like <laughs> you know like this amp that I would love to have half of sure right. and and like 
You, you can't, He's probably you just can't running direct anyway. Yeah, you, just can't, you can't hear him. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's well, not, but a lot of it also too. I mean, I talked to Brent about this. Like, they don't people. I I don't know what it is, but they don't they don't play with any attack, so they can't get like that. They, they can't do the metal. Like they can't play with their fingers. Sure, I yeah. can't play with a pick, and it's not because I'm like too good to play with a pig it's just that i i actually i struggled with it when i started playing because mm-hmm. i i just didn't know how to do it i couldn't get that i like to f- actually feel it yeah. tactily I mean, i've been playing bass for over 10 years and i think i'm all right but I, if i drop my pick on on stage <laughs> i am done for i cannot do it you know he just I walk barely just like, last hand your bass player to the next guy right, who has a pick right. and I walk just, off. I start getting like carpal tunnel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it's just that that's you know that's just how I learned and not and I had watched a, I mean I, I remember trying to play with a pick because I saw Paul Simonon and I was like you know I want to uh, yeah. he had that and uh you know and I, I wanted to get that but I re- I just it was easier for me to just do it you know like. Is uh, is there anybody now or any bands now that have the same type of rhythm section attitude type thing as like the Steve Harris and all the you know? I don't know, man. I like mean, a heavy I've, band. I've I've I like feel that, like I've, I've stepped you know. back into metal and I hadn't been there, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Like you know, I mean, I I just wasn't there. That wasn't what I was paying attention to. Um, but you know, I, I since I've started again listening to it um you know i mean i can hear i mean look man coc with mike dean mike dean's a great bass player yeah you know he is so like they're putting out records mike dean's on the records those are good records right Mm -hmm. and and reed and mike are great um uh but you know uh i don't know i mean like most of what i listen to like i said the bass is there but you can't really hear it so it's like metallica albums without cliff burton it's like, it's, it's, like yeah. there, it's there. It's like a presence. That's it's a frequency, but it's not actually a. You well, know. did you hear? Like somebody made these remixes of Metallica where they actually turned the bass up, and uh-huh. it's like, oh wow, that's freaking great! Like right. it's much better. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. better. Surprise, yeah. surprise! You're supposed. I think they call it like Jason's Metallica or something, and they turned it up. Yeah, because really? it's wild. When he joined Metallica, they like didn't listen to his opinion at all because they just could not. They couldn't get past that Cliff was gone. You right. know, like they loved yeah. Cliff and he died and it sucked. And they brought this awesome guy in, which Jason Newstead was a great bass player. And, right. but I mean, was he as good as Cliff Burton? I don't know. That's up in the air. But he at least knew when they were recording uh, Injustice for All that there's no bass in this mix, you know? And like what yeah. actually got pressed and sent out, there's right. nothing there. It's yeah. thin. Yeah. Well, it, so I'd like to hear that mix. But then Injustice for All, didn't they take it to like some. Uh, producer or engineer that did a bunch of European metal albums that they Probably. liked a lot and then it was just that's what they got and it was like, oh. Truio is really awesome. Now he is Yeah, the the, the yeah. guy they have now who was on um you know he was with Ozzy forever yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, he's a great bass player for he's sure. A, he's a very serious player. Like he um I mean I I had occasion to be around the the that you know the, our, the uh, this guy named Trivet Wingo who was from this town that played in the band called The Sword, that yeah. opened for Metallica a lot, and then and Trivet played with Tim and I in a band. Right. Um, and you know Truio, like he he would do he does clinics while they're traveling, and he's very serious about about playing. It's weird, man. It's like he was in you know, Suicidal, right? That's where I found yeah, out about him. Yeah, yeah. Um, Suicidal tendencies. Like when Suicidal tendencies started getting like really like a funk. Set thing going, it, like what, that's like, kind of like Lollapalooza where, style. That's right. where I like, got out of suicidal. I'm, you know, the first album is where I'm at with that band for sure. But not that they haven't made other good stuff, but I, I feel like when they started getting real super like slap happy bass in their stuff, I was like, I'm not, I don't know. Yeah. Which is weird. I love Primus. I'm not dissing fucking slap bass at all, but no, it's fine to diss that. It's <laughs> yeah, well, it's Primus fun. is kind of like not really slap bass. It's like. Yo, I got a fretless bass, and I liked that King Crimson album with the Chapman stick, so I'm yeah. going to just play that, you know? And he's he's awesome, and he's yeah. very he's yeah. very creative, and I love it. You know, it's a little... Uh, it's funny. I remember David Sims from Jesus Lizard, like, which I was, I was thought of, the, thought of him as soon as I got here because of that. Uh, yeah, guy. the dude that owns those was bought it because of that. And yeah. then me and Sullivan one time, uh, 
it had the same practice space, and we just put that next to an Eden 610, and, like, he's just like, for all the people goes, right now goes, who are like listening, deets, going, what the like, fuck? He's like, are they like these deets got no hate. low end, son. Right, yeah. They got no balls, son. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what's up with your boys' rig, son? Yeah, yeah, that's a deets. He, they're talking about a deets fifteen, and that's what that. But that's what that's what Sims liked was like, yeah, yeah, two fifteens with no drivers in them. There's no drivers in this. No, no, there all. Aren't. there's no, there's no like. Uh, so I mean, it, they're only voicing like, it, it, like. It, the weird thing is that you got you've got that cabinet that doesn't have any highs shouldn't really be reproducing highs and then his sound is mostly highs like yeah. if you look yeah. at the gk the way he set it up it was always that we're talking about david sims from yeah. jesus lizard and scratch acid yes um it was, yeah. bass tone is a very aggressive almost guitar like it's yeah. like it's like the whole idea of his sound is like he's gonna take a square peg and fit it through a round hole. yeah yeah it was and it, and and it it's works man it's really awesome sound but like you know uh I, I think I started talking about this because we were talking talk about Les Claypool. Yeah, we were talking about Les Claypool, and he Slap was like, happy, he was man. he was like, yeah, I don't know, that's a little cute for me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Like, yeah. I just saw Prime. Just thought, I, I just saw Primus. It was very cute. Yeah, <laughs> it is a cute. Show. And I was like, oh, come on, Sims. Like, you know, I mean, because all he ever does, like, he, I mean, he's awesome, but everything he does is like is a pentatonic scale, like everything. So, um. He does them really well. And sure, they sound he, awesome. he does. Do 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 do. You know, but and he has that awesome, just a great sense of drive right. in his playing that I love. Like, it's about man, it's about musical imagination. You know, that's what it gets down to, and that's what, that's why I like some of the pop, the 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 bass players that are playing pop right now. That's why I like John Sullivan because it's a musical imagination you know that that is Im- immediately identifiable and uh yeah it's their sound as opposed to i just play bass it's right. like i have my it's not that i play bass it's that i do it my way yeah and that's what music should be i completely agree with you yeah on that for me anyway. getting back into like doing the guar thing were you worried about how it was going to be perceived that it was you or that they did they just chose you or uh no i'm not i mean i'm not i, I i've given up worrying about most things you know the list of things the (laughs) The list of things that i don't give a shit about grows every day and (laughs) that's certainly one of the i mean like you know i'm just gonna do i mean i i i i i did pay attention to like the fans like you know because facebook you can't help it like i go on there and i'm like and they're people like this guy is a guy from keep on and that man sucks and they're going to play this and you know, it's going to suck. Um, I mean, here's what I thought when they asked me to play, my immediate reaction was this. I have a Dave is a baritone voice type and there's no way that I can replicate a baritone voice type. And if you're listening to this, you can hear that I have a, smoky damaged sounding tenor that's very high <laughs> and like and that's you know and that's what i have i mean yeah. that's what i'm working with and he had a totally different set of pipes that were you know and he used he used them in a very original way um and you know that said i'm i've become very adept at imitating other singers so uh it's easy for me to sort of listen and, and try to learn his parts and do them the best I can. Uh, and I am trying to do his parts. Yeah. Like, I'm not trying to, um, you know, I mean, there's, the, there's ones that are just clearly too low. So I have to come up with something else. Right. Um, you know, and it's weird. The ones that the, actually the song that's hardest for me that they do is the road behind, which is a song that I wrote. And I wrote the lyrics for that and everything. And I was originally supposed to sing it on the record and Brocky didn't want to sing it because he thought it was, uh, it was uh he, he he thought it was too pop right and he didn't want to do it isn't it like a it's kind of a rip off you're kind of making fun of um guns and roses guns and roses yeah. patience right because yeah. they came out that shitty acoustic right thing yeah where he's like whistling yeah. for fucking yeah. 20 <laughs> minutes that is right. pretty it's bad it's the fucking worst yeah man. and that's road behind yeah. and like and you know he, he and Brian brocky uh was, yeah he was like I, i'm not doing that and then we you know uh, the producer glenn robinson was like oh yeah well we were gonna record this song so, and it was a good song, you know. And then in the studio, Brocky decided he would sing it and that I would sing. And actually, I take that back. I tracked it 
and all they kept of my track was the choruses. And right. that's what's on there now. Oh. So the choruses sound great. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, and, a, it's a weird guar song, obviously. Yeah, it is. They're only sort of like radio friendly um, song. Yeah, it has whistles on it. it so it's definitely it. available for radio consumption. Out of all of the guar tracks you did, bass wise, like you listen to this shit and you're like, that was fucking badass. <laughs> like you're saying, like, you know, it's, you know, you know, guar, the whole thing. You know, but you're like, you kind of, it's like, yeah, that, that shit was tight. You know? <laughs> Is there anything there bass wise that you were like, fuck yeah? I, I mean, uh, for me, a lot of times it's, it's, there's a lot of guar bass that I can't figure out anymore. Like, um, there are fans who ask me, like, how do you play the fills? Cause you know how they are. Like, they know everything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They're like, how do you play the fills? in have you seen me like i've been asked that a number of times and i'm like i don't know like and i sat right. down to try to do it and i couldn't do it and there's keep on songs that are like that too that i can't remember the line it was like a muscle memory thing at the time you're, yeah. saying, you're just in that zone yeah and, and, I, and, and i just don't know what i did like so i can't after you know like 20 years just sh shit that out right again. right, like, right. So, i mean so i have to do it by learn listening to it um and it and uh, um, sometimes I can get it and get close, but, you know, really, like, I just don't know. I mean, I just don't know. Isn't that the most, like, annoying thing in the world about the Internet is that now anyone can just write you and ask you some yeah, shit? That, that yeah. Then you might not even care about it right at that moment, but then, like, <laughs> two hours later, you're like, you know what? Fuck, I should know how to fucking well, play yeah. my own. I should know how to play my own fucking song. On the flip side, you can just look up your own lyrics that you don't remember. Yeah, right. Just, exactly. you know, somebody else has done the work for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, or it, they're wrong, though. A lot yeah. of the time, it's all wrong. And a lot of the bass covers are always wrong because they never can figure out that we tune to E flat. So they, they must think it's like so much harder than it is, you know, because they're they're fretting all these strings that are usually open for me. So, right. I've given um, up on tabs, man. Tabs, tabs are so bad. Man. Yeah, tabs. <laughs> tabs. Uh, use so your inaccurate. ears, man. Just use your ears. That's how you get better. It is how you get better. And, you know, the good thing about it maybe is, like, I, I do like the bass covers, like when you, where you can watch somebody play it. That's very That's useful. That's very informative. Yeah, yeah. I, but, learned, I, I watch a tutorial on, on tasteful slap bass. Sure, man. Thumb slap, you know. Learn how to play a James Jamerson line from watching some dude yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, some, some uh, guy in Italy or something. Right, yeah, playing, yeah. And but, killing it. But, you know, like, I mean, the, the, but the answer to it, to your question, is that there are guar songs. Like, what I like, I mean, I think of myself as a songwriter more than a bass player. So there yeah, are more, I guess part wise more so is what I mean. Yeah. Like, part wise. Yeah. So, I mean, my favorite Guar songs that I love, I love space cake. I love Sonder commando. Um, but like bass lines that I did, um, uh, you know, in Guar, it was, it was usually just things that I could slip in. So mm -hmm. like, I mean, I did like, have you seen me? I like the bass in that a lot. I like the bass in, uh, um, Gorgor, man, Gorgor has a great, some great bass in it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, just, so, you know, even, I mean, most of the songs on scum dogs, like I really like those, those bass lines. Um, you know, I was always trying to, <laughs> I, I was trying to, Celtic Frost had like, you know, the guy would always play fifths. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. I thought it was a big deal to throw fifths in. Right, know? right, right. I listened to it and I'm like, wow. I'm awesome. Do, 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 fifth, do, do, do. You know, it's like, whoa. Yeah. What was it about Guar that made you want to leave the first time? I wonder. Because, I, I mean, Scum Dogs was pretty popular. And, I mean, you were in the band when... I feel like you were in the band when I found out about Guar, and I found out about Guar by Beavis and Butthead. That's how I think a lot of people found music back then. Sure. It was like if Beavis and Butthead said it was fucking cool, you went and bought it. And I was wondering, was that was there a drastic effect in record sales because Beavis and Butthead loved Guar? I, I you know, as you were saying that, I was just thinking about that that rap video that they love Christmas time in Hollis. Christmas time and it, in Hollis and, they love, and, and every time the little elf dude would come on, they'd be like, ah! They'd scream. Yeah. I wondered if that song was a hit because of Beavis and Butthead. But like... Could have been. Yeah. Um, I mean, like... I can't. I'm sorry. What you asked My me question, question was, was, as a band, you know, you're, you're playing, you're doing your you know, normal touring or whatever, right. and then all of a sudden... 
20 seconds of a song or 30 seconds of your song gets played on Beavis and Butthead. Oh, yeah. And they're telling every stoner, fucking yeah. drunk, loser, <laughs> motherfucker in the world, like, Guar fucking rules. You There's know? some interesting things about people's perception of Guar and the way it's changed over time. And back then, I mean, what I remember is that, yeah, everybody had seen, and even to this day, most a lot of people say that they saw Guar on Beavis and Butthead or me and Dave on the Joan Rivers show. That was, I was just I, uh, going uh, to bring that up. That so, was where I saw it. Yeah. And then also I remember Dave being on the pre-John Stewart yeah. Daily Show. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, the, you know, so, I mean, those things were huge for us. And, and, and at the time, like, Guar was on 120 Minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. we were coming up and we were riding up to New York and, like, MTV was still... A thing. I mean, they still had a lot of power. Yeah. They still uh, played fucking music. <laughs> well, they had, you know, they had an amazing idea, which was that, you know, we're going to have this television show, this television station that plays commercials as their main content. The commercials are the content. Yeah. The commercials for songs interrupted by commercials. So right. it's like, mm -hmm. it's just a money making shit storm. Like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I mean, in a way, it sucks that they got away from that. But they also, some of that, you know, MTV, when I was coming up, I found out about punk rock on shows like Night Flight on the USA Network. Um, and you couldn't really find it. And MTV was the beginning of that sort of information age. And, and you know, Beavis and Baguar was right there at the right time to be picked up on cable television and be circulated. Um you know, and, and Beavis and Butthead were huge for us. Um, I think you asked a qu question. Like did, it, did it have a drastic effect on actual physical sales? Like them saying this rules like. Yeah. I mean, I think that that certainly I don't know about I, like. I mean, the record that we had when I was in the band, the record that had done the best was Scum Dogs. Right. And then uh, and, you know, and that it was. Uh, a song off of Scum Dogs. I'm pretty sure that they were. That I think it's uh, I think it's sick of you. Maybe it could be, or maybe, or maybe it was a. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't. It might have even been Gorgor. I can't remember, but it's something. Actually, I think it. I think now that I now that I think back, I think it's something. It has to have been something off of uh, America Must Be Destroyed, because that's the one that we made the. The really cool video for, and I think that's that's what they're was watching. Was Gorgor then? Huh? Yeah, Gorgor. Um, you know who so knows? I was on that one. Yeah, yeah. Who knows what? I I can't remember what what the song was, but yeah. it'd, it'd be easy to find out. But you know, so I mean, I, you know, certainly when I was in the band, the, it, they were we were selling more and more records up to this Toilet Earth, um, which was the last record that I was on, mm -hmm. and I left. I mean, you started to ask that question, and it's worth answering. I. I left I didn't want to be in it anymore because uh, I, I feel like some people think that it was because I had Keep On and, but the truth of the matter is that I could have done Keep On and Guar at the same time I had been for more than a year um, but I, I was I actually had a lot of like being on in Guar was hard it's, it, it looks hard man and and it's not being, just a normal band, you know. No, and being on the road with a lot of different people, and and for me, I had like a sort of an undiagnosed anxiety disorder. Sure. So I would get out on the road, and there's nothing more rootless than that the feeling of like you know being and having an anxiety attack in the bathroom of some club in Poland. Like you know, it's, <laughs> you're so far that from home. Sucks, you know, it's yeah. like. And and I, I so, for me, you know, I, I had started drinking a lot, and I just I was not healthy. And keep on was like this kind of breath of fresh air. It was like oh, well. And the other thing was, I will admit that, you know, talking about like the the bass parts in Guar, like, you know, and I said that it was usually like the songs and then little things that I would throw in. Mm -hmm. um, keep on it was all the things I would throw in. It was all the cool bass lines and like, you know, it was, that's what it was about was about the songs themselves were built around, usually around drum parts and yeah. then, and then that's, a bass part. That's what I think is really cool about Keepone is it's a trio that is like an equal trio. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it sounds weird, but it's like the police or something like oh, that. You yeah. know, everything has a like uh, it has its own place. Like the guitar doesn't step on the bass, and the drums provide just enough. Uh, and then the vocal, there's like you know, it's like loud music. It's aggressive, but there's there's harmonic content. Right. There's yeah. chord changes. There's vocal harmonies. Yeah. Uh, there's counter melodies like it's yep. it's actually kind of heavy shit, but I like it the same way. I'll buy. I'll be like, yo, I I, I like this this Mingus small ensemble album because it's or I like this string quartet because it's easier to digest than like right. a giant orchestra. You know what I yeah. mean? It's condensed, but I, I dig it. You know. Yeah, it's cool. I, I fucking love Keybone. Well, thanks. Keybone is fucking awesome. Keybone is awesome, dude. <laughs> awesome, Mike Bishop. Yeah. Mike Bishop killing the bass like. The thing with the bang, the little flamenco things tight, dude. So you were you're in bathrooms having panic attacks, yeah. And then you got to get on stage and be beefcake, you know. Yeah, and I and I had gotten to the point where like you know, I mean I'll, I'll be honest, with you, I mean in some ways coming back and doing this stuff for these guys is uh, part of uh, me in a sense. Um, I, at least I feel like this is sort of making making up or making good on the fact that I really didn't do my best for a while in that band, um, especially towards the end. And, uh, uh, you know, so being able to do something to help them now is important to me. Um, sure. and, uh, I didn't, you know, but yeah, I wanted to do, you know, keep on, on the other hand was this band that like was this big, like explosion of like, you, you just, you, you play at the absolute top of your ability. um, and then keep on people know there's some aspects of keep on that people don't understand which is that because they haven't seen it very much but keep, my favorite thing about keep on is something that in richmond i don't think we ever did very much which is improvise on stage as a heavy band yeah and heavy bands don't do that yeah, yeah. keep on did that and we did it a lot and like um and it was cool and like and you know we've got recordings of it that are awesome and, i would love to hear that and a lot of those improv improvisations would turn into songs um yeah. but you know yeah i mean we had these like moments when we did that and that was really fun and 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 uh you know i mean keep on with uh with ed trask playing drums there's nothing better i mean it's it's just so fun to me to do that and at the time it was also very healthy for me to do that because whereas in Guar, I was drinking myself to death, having anxiety attacks and riding around on a bus and being like, you know, feeling lost in keep on. I was in charge. If I said no, then the show would stop. And, and if I said go, then the show went. Right. So I was in control of it. And also when we went out, these guys were really, they weren't like, you know, uh, they didn't, Tim and Ed didn't really drink a lot. And when we went out, they were very healthy. Um, and, and Ed would do exercising. And so I would exercise with him. Keep on is a band that where, where we would wake up at six in the morning to go to a gym every day after yeah, we played. That's crazy. And yeah, but it was awesome. It was awesome. Like we were riding around and I was in such good shape and I felt safe you know that's like, that's cool man yeah. i mean so that's why that's why i quit i mean like was i wanted that i wanted to feel safe did you is that <laughs> <laughs> i think that's I'm, reasonable Guar yeah. doesn't <laughs> Guar is definitely not safe no right? it's not it's not <laughs> how many people toured at that point like how many cuz there were, you guys had the slaves and everything i mean was i it mean a, there were times when there was 18 of us on the road wow. Dude, that know. is crazy and the, how and do you was, feed that many people on the road? How do you make that happen? Well, I mean, they, you know, the the earliest, the funnest tours in Guar were the one, the ones that were the most out of control, like the early tours that we did on the bus. And when I say bus, I mean the Guar school bus. And we were driving around playing. Like, I mean, I was just down in. Uh, we were just, we just went down to Nags Head, and like one of the first places that Guar would play was in Nags Head. Yeah. At, what we the played, fuck? yeah, at, in Nags Head at a place called Mexicanos, which was a Mexican restaurant. We played at the King's Head Inn numerous times in uh, uh, in Norfolk. Um, I know the King's. We played, yeah, shitty little places, man. And we played, you know, uh, we played like uh, just a bunch of like sandwich shops and uh, Taco Land in San Antonio, Texas, was one of the legendary guar shows. 
Um, even in San Francisco, we play the Covered Wagon. Well, the first time we went, we played the, the these unknown venues, and the, there was nothing cooler about the, the with Guar than getting there. Nobody'd seen it before, and you walk <laughs> into town and like, and you play this show, and like, you know, and the, and the other thing is that information wasn't the same, so there weren't kids putting up videos of it. They didn't know what was coming. Sure. All they had was like, after we did that tour. Finally, like, you know, Flipside was like, all right, we'll write about this. Maximum Rock and Roll was like, at the time, very political. So they were like, you know. Oh, oh Maximum Rock and is Roll this, is always uh, fucking, they always hate everything. Yeah. What like, time uh, period is this? Is this early 90s? Or this is this is late, late 80s, late 80s, early 90s. Okay. So like, you know, so this 87, is like Scumdogs 88. Yeah. Tour. Yeah. Um, yeah. The touring for Scumdogs was that way. The touring for Hello was really that way. Sure. We did a national tour for Hello. And, uh, um, you know that that was so the first time that we we rolled out there to california was on the back of hello man and that yeah people were like sh- you know that feeling that was an incredible feeling man like to to the to do a guar show in front of people who had never seen it before yeah and they didn't know how to react <laughs> that's what happened to me the oh first God. time i ever saw guar I, I doubt i don't think you were in the band probably this time i was I was 16, and they were coming to uh, 930 Club. Was like, I think it was right when they opened the new 930 Club. And uh, my friend just had an extra ticket, and I would go to any show. If, you know, it didn't matter, you know. Um, so we go to Quar, and I was just, what the fuck is <laughs> This is crazy. Like, well, you're not prepared. Right. And, and to know. this day, I, you know, I don't think there's ever been a band that – got burned into my brain like the first time you saw Guar, you know because <laughs> there's a guy fucking squirting blood out of a fucking huge dick and, yeah. i mean it's just it's unreal you yeah. know and it's it's it i think the thing about Guar that i like the most is that it's better live obviously you know like the, the I, records are all cool and i've listened to some of the records and enjoyed some of them but it's more about Oh shit, Guar's playing. I'm definitely gonna watch them play. You're never not gonna watch Guar over some were, other band. Were know? there ever clubs that like refused to have you guys play due to the like messy nature of your shows? Surprisingly, uh, no. Um, I mean, uh, if there were, then they were sort of meted out in the process of booking. Um, there were clubs like in the very beginning. I mean, we quickly learned that we had to like sort of wrap everything up and do all that stuff. Um, but I mean, did you guys brought your own stuff to? Wrap oh yeah, it? we brought all the plastic and oh, wrapped man. everything. So in you had plastic. like a little cleaning yeah. crew on. The- <laughs> yeah, I mean, now there were like when we went to Europe, that was interesting because like the first time we played, like you know, they book us in, like, okay, so they book us in this uh, church, and the church has like <laughs> these gorgeous. Like no. stained blonde wooden floors, yeah. You know, and we just like fuck that shit all up. And the dude at the <laughs> at the end of the night, they're like, "You've got to clean this." And we're like, "No, we don't. We're the band. Like, we don't sit here and fucking sweep your floor." Like, yeah. Oh no. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, it it took. Yeah, I mean, there was. Was there as much? I mean, because I mean, when I saw Guar, obviously there's a, a more uh, production value behind it. Obviously, I mean, you're talking about a time when you guys probably didn't have that much money to to do gags or whatever. So, well, that's the whole thing is that we always did our like you know we did the, our version of them at first, and they and in a lot of ways that was the Guar that was the best. Um, you know, it was less, it wasn't as impressive. The 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 effects weren't great, but they were funny and you know and and then we, and we would do it no matter where we would do the decap at what's the a, decap the, the decapitation like oh, you know okay. so we bust through we <laughs> bust through, yeah. i know what's a decap <laughs> yeah we I'm do an the, asshole right we do the decapitation we do the bad you know we'd like cut the tits off pull the guts out do the dick <laughs> why spread. why would we'd, you do that we do that we do that at every single place we played it didn't matter Hell how yeah. much how much time did it take to prep that so you leave one place and you got to reset up every gap mike didn't set that shit up dude <laughs> that's true i'm just thinking <laughs> you know because i watch a lot of horror movies you know and how horror movies are made and a lot of it's kind of the same as what guar is doing in a way well with, they, with, we had guys in the band who were dedicated artists and performers and they 
That's um, what's co- that was what's cool about yeah, Guar. You know, it, it is. They don't even play music. No. They're just there to like. Oh, yeah. this is I'm the fucking guy who makes all the crazy That's shit right. work. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Real, real quick, I uh, I got some listener response here. Uh, buddy Damien said uh, the Beavis and Butthead episodes. They did three Guar songs. Uh, they did uh, Jack the World. Road Behind and Sadama Go Go. Oh, that's probably the one I saw with Sadama Go Go. Yeah. Thank you, listener. Yeah, Damien. <laughs> Damien Damien up in Jersey, dude. Yeah, man. Now so two of those show. two of those would have been uh um off of uh this uh, off of uh, America Must Be Destroyed. Right. And mm-hmm. then Jack the World, I think, was on this toilet earth. I don't know. What, um, you know what really sucks is that the last time you guys did a Keep Home show, I really wanted to go. I think you guys were doing it at Gallery 5. That same night, I was um, I was doing WRIR, substituting over there, uh, before I realized it just like wasn't for me um, as far as being able to say fucking shit and all the stuff I like to do on microphone. <laughs> but what I was doing was I was filling in for somebody that was interviewing Dave. And he was in studio, and I, I was the only time I ever met Dave, and I watched him get interviewed, and she must have hit that dump button 17 times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, Dave, was it Fontaine? That was it was it? Fontaine. Yeah. Fontaine oh, I've made Fontaine hit the dump yeah. button Dude, before, she too. Had, she, and Dave just didn't care, man. <laughs> and it was the funniest freaking thing. I, I was stood in the back. I met him. He was super nice, and I thought, man, I, it was when I was getting this show going. I was doing this show out of my fucking... Uh, my one, not even one bedroom, so a one room apartment was all my gear doing radio. <laughs> and I was like, man, I bet you Dave Brock, he would come on my show, even though it's in some fucking he would. apartment complex or whatever. She, she played, it was funny because when we were there last time, Fontaine played a, an interview from the old, like, DCE days, um, or, or the old U of, University of Richmond radio. Oh, shit. And, uh, and, and it was an interview with me and Dave from, like, 1992, and... It was really funny, um, really, really funny stuff, man. We, we, we the main gist of the interview was that we went person by person through the uh, interview and and like and attacked personally attacked all of the other members of Guar. <laughs> <laughs> And then she was she was like, who in Richmond do you really hate? And without hesitation, both of us said at the same time, Chris Bobst. Like, both of us said that. <laughs> I don't know if you know Bobst, but we were like, you know. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> It was it was just nice. All that, I said was I knew him. Mike yeah, I knew him. <laughs> he couldn't have been a fucking nicer dude, though. You know, I mean, in between uh, breaks. He was in Guar, wasn't he? <laughs> Bobst, yeah. Yeah, he was. yeah. But um, I just I I don't it says know. So on his article, it says, I, it says I was definitely boring. bummed when I you know heard that you know he had died because I, I remember thinking like I'm I'm getting to the point now. There's listenership. I feel like I could ask Dave Brocky or someone from Guar to come in. You know, I'm glad that you're here. I mean, that's freaking awesome. He, but I, it must have been a nightmare for all you guys when that happened. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, but you know, yeah, Dave, Dave would he was a a really great guy. There's no no question about it. Really nice. Very generous, um, very just so creative and so full of energy and uh, and ideas. I mean, you know, just really. Uh, I mean, and and he was uh, he was a great leader of men too, and and a, and a just a a, a a fun person to be around, uh, and, and especially for me, I mean, the one one dynamic of Guar that people should understand, and I think they will when some of the stuff that that is coming out. There's some sort of some interesting material coming out about Guar now. When they do the 30 year, they're going to do like uh, a lot of it is the, the more interesting thing about Guar for me is the real story. Like that that's really interesting and. Part of that for me, like the the dynamic for for me being in the band, was that I was very young and they were much older. So, and a lot of people don't know that, but like, yeah, like I thought Brocky, all you guys were like about the same. We're age. not all the same age, right. like you know. So there there was the kind of the young people in the band were me and Dirks, um, and you know Dirks came in later, so it was right. it was me and Dirks, and now me Dirks and Brad were the same age, okay, um, but. Uh, at first, it was me in the band with a bunch of guys who had been in that sort of first wave of punk in Richmond. So I was like, you know, I was a hardcore punk kid. So these were guys who had been there in the like, 
you know, the Sex Pistols punk almost, right? right? Like white, and and it started uh, this band called White Cross, which was uh, yeah, that's a cool band, dude. Yeah, so you know, and those were the, and so they were all like you know five or six years older than me, which when you're that young makes a pretty big difference. It does. So you were like like out of like you were the same age as like the younger Rodriguez brother, not the older one. Uh, Tommy's still older than me. Okay. Tommy. Tommy's. uh, That fucking old fart. Yeah, <laughs> Tom, Tommy. Tommy, he's not much, but he's a few, he's a few years older than me. I mean, he was definitely still in already in bands that were playing around. So in the you end. were growing up in the middle of like the whole post punk thing. <sighs> I was growing up in the middle of the hardcore punk thing. So like early eighty or the, when you became 80s. musically aware. When I became musically aware and started liking punk, it was uh, nineteen eighty two, eighty three. Okay, so like hardcore was just really starting to roll right um, yeah and uh it's like the golden age of punk yeah i mean minor man. threat and all yeah. that stuff that were you were you into west coast stuff or east coast stuff more um <clears throat> well you know i liked it's funny because like if you i have i had a band uh-huh. and the guilty it was called the guilty the guilty were not a hardcore band the guilty were a punk band and right. and we stood out in that way because like I just didn't I didn't want to play hardcore like I didn't I didn't like the music so much like I wanted to play I liked like the Sex Pistols and maybe you didn't like the restraints of hardcore or you didn't I didn't like, like the I scene didn't, it was just no, no was just, I, I didn't like the music like the, it right. was just kind of <laughs> you know now but when I listened to it in the hands of the bad brains right Right, but the, but that's such that's a, that's a completely that's not the different same thing. thing. It is, exactly, it yeah. is, man. I mean, like if you think about it, think about. The, I'll tell you what. What really blows your mind is that the Bad Brains were just a hardcore band. It's just mm-hmm. that they did hardcore so much better than anybody else yeah. that it was <laughs> like, you know. And they also though they were into they they too were into punk. So they're bringing in like the Damned and they're doing all this, right. you know. And they had these sort of crazy. And they were into metal, and they had that influence in there. They had a great bass player too. Oh yeah, they, and and every I mean they were just you know yeah, they're, they're still into, they're the Bad Bearings are my favorite band. Yeah, in, and they're into ever. non rock music. I mean they're into reggae and stuff. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, when they started doing the reggae too, too, I was kind of I was thrown off when I started hearing because I mean obviously I got into Bad Brains way later than you did obviously, but you know I always loved the early stuff, and then when they got in the reggae shit, I kind of. When I started hearing that stuff on their albums, uh-huh. I got out of it. But then about four years later, I went back and listened to Rock for Light. Uh-huh. Um, Rock for Light is, like, the best fucking record oh, ever. Well, like, man. the early Bad Brain stuff, the thing that's crazy about it is when they do do the dub stuff and all uh-huh. that, it makes you realize, wow, reggae records were made on shitty equipment in awful studios yeah. by poor people. Yeah. Reggae was made on shitty equipment and right. awful studios by poor people. Yeah. Like it's like the parallel is like, wow, it's pretty much the same thing and just a different demographic. And, but you know Yeah. And and actually the truth of the matter is for me that like when I was able to listen with an open mind to that reggae stuff, I can't think of um any band from America. There weren't any American reggae bands that were anywhere near as good as when the Bad Brains did do reggae. Dude, you have never so, heard. <laughs> yeah, you've great, never heard UB40, man. UB40 is fucking awesome. I love UB40, oh, but like I would say that as a joke. <laughs> man, no, UB40 is great. It's really? not. Yeah, fuck. I yeah, remember they get, had like a song about getting. Isn't there a song of theirs that is basically about fucking a girl on the butt? UB40. Uh, probably a lot of them, dude. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a song that is Most, red, red, red wine, dude. Red, not red, 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 red wine. <laughs> if I could be a lion in the sun, <laughs> they, they, you know, those guys had some good, uh, very sophisticated melodies. You know, I mean, they're a good Wouldn't band. Is there any a uh, band that you look at right now and you just go, man, if War didn't fucking exist, these motherfuckers would not be making any money? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of them. Um, What's the top one? I have one in my head. Let's play uh, this game. What is in my head? <laughs> okay. Um, Lordy, um, Slipknot. It's there's ah, the one. That's the one yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, they, these bands, I don't think. That put a production value into, like, masks and. Yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, no. I, I don't think that they would that they would be doing what they're doing without Guar. I think the influence, the cultural influence of Guar is pretty extensive. Um 
and uh, it's interesting how like you know people they people like Guar that shouldn't like it like like <laughs> like mayors and stuff like you know like really official well, people. Brocky you know? was on Red Eye a bunch. Yeah, and, like, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like well, yeah. that's that's an interesting. Uh, interesting place to be put. It's- I don't know why, but I think it's because people recognize, like, like, I mean, you can see Guar if you watch any Oakland Raiders football game. That's Guar and the fans. Uh, you know, that's where they get that look, man. They Guar registered through like professional wrestling. It registered through, uh, you know, just it changed the way that um, that people what people thought was sort of possible um and what's entertaining and how to entertain you yeah know? right and that like it doesn't have to be you can take anything and fucking skew it a little bit and then make it a little bit more um well a little bit more accessible because of the the theatrics of it is more accessible than maybe the music is or maybe wrestling's not so accessible but the fucking dumb banter People yeah. like, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like I love wrestling. I, I mean, fucking that's hate not a wrestling. Joke at all. <laughs> oh my god! I think wrestling, I, so and good. I didn't appreciate wrestling until I was about 24. Oh, that's awesome. And, and the reason the that only is reason like I the appreciate the worst it, age. Yeah. Hold to on, get whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on. The only reason I appreciate it is like the dudes. It was like a the band dudes. that tore. It's like check it, it was out. The dudes. Check it out. It's a band the dudes that tore. All really hot. It was like a band that toured all these sexy men. <laughs> uh, but um, no, it's like they went out there, fake beat each other up every night. It's on a script. There's like a sound crew that sets everything up. They break all their chairs on each other's heads or whatever yeah. they do. I mean, yeah, this stuff's dumb and everything. But as from a production standpoint and somebody that's worked in that field, it's very impressive yeah. that they do it live. I mean, there's a delay, of course. Sure. But just the fact that they fucking do it live that often is like, man, I say Vince. There's Vince definitely a man is you know there's definitely killing it. Dude. I'll I'll give you that that there is like with the people that are that's what I appreciate the lighting the camera angles I mean you can watch I'm always blown away by you know the, the way professional football is broadcasted and all the shit that goes into that you know to make it work live and shit is definitely a, a high a high caliber of badass motherfuckers that know how to mic and yeah. film and I mean years right. you know of progression and that's. What I learned about Dave Brocky in that interview that I was just sitting in the back of, uh, he's just like a huge Redskins fan. Oh yeah, yeah. He was big, but he big was sports fan. he was railing against. He was like, "We have to change the team name." And I wanted yeah. to be able to jump in and, and talk to him about it because I've defended not changing the name on this show. Uh, and he was like, "I mean, he had Redskins all over him. It said Redskins right. on everything." <laughs> that he is kind of odd if he's like, it said we should change the name. But until then, I'm gonna I'm gonna wear well, all this Redskins that's, gear. That's that's actually part of like you know one of the things about Brocky is that uh, um, he was way you know he, he, here he is he's this guy that's like in this his band is like you know doing all this stuff that could really pretty easily be read off as homophobic and as uh, and as sexist. Yeah. Um, but he was doing that stuff with intention. I mean, he was deliberately trying to draw attention to the attitudes of people towards women and homosexuals. Like, I mean, you know, and he was, and his own attitudes towards that were actually very, uh, progressive. And, uh, you know, and so. sometimes just because the the word fag is used doesn't mean right. that it's homophobic. And he, well, I mean, yeah, and he would also drop the n bomb and do just about anything else that he would do. You know, he was, oh yeah, he was just like, I mean, he was wide open, like you know. I I think that's okay though. I, I'm that way too. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna get on here and start fucking saying, you know. Well, I have uh, in context. I don't like the n bomb. I'm, I'm kind of. No, I like to say, you know, I don't like to hear it, but I don't. Restricting one. If you said it right then, if right. you just said the word, yeah, I wouldn't have been like, "Oh man, mark that spot because we got to go back and edit it out." Because <laughs> no. like, you know, fuck that, you know. And if it's in an artistic nature, well, I mean, it's all in context, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would be out of context to just start but saying I think, <laughs> like horrible things just to prove a point right now. But <laughs> let's Brocky all, but, you know what I mean? But I mean, yes, Rocky would create a, that context. Sure, right? exactly. Well, let me uh, uh, when. Uh, you were talking. I think I saw something where you were talking about Brocky, and you were saying that, uh, you know, that you know the, the the homophobia aspect of it and stuff was misunderstood, and that you know, I guess his brother, um, 
His brother Andrew was uh, was gay. Yeah. And uh, was a really big influence on in Dave's life, and uh, he was a wonderful, just a he was just a great dude, right. man. He was really smart and really, uh, you know, he was like Brocky. You could see his personality there, but but Andrew was super nice. He was like like the light side of Brocky, you know. Um, uh, just really, you know, I mean, not, I mean, Dave was really nice too, but like Andrew was really nice, you know, and, uh, it, it just like, yeah, I mean, Dave loved him and really admired him. And, and I think that he worked through, uh, some of the issues surrounding his brother on stage. And that's actually, you know, in the long run, when people judge Guar, I mean, I think they're going to look at some things and they're going to see some depth to that band that, that, has that people don't really know about like you know and, and the fans know i think some of them know um there's a lot to guar there's a lot of layers to that onion and there's a lot of uh um you know certainly dave's like i think in the what you might be talking about in the memorial i talked about andrew and i talked about his brother uh about like aids beer and all that stuff and how you know i mean yeah when dave did that i said this in the memorial i'll say it again he was talking about AIDS and talking about homosexuality in front of and and encouraging he would create what he liked to do was to create doubt in the minds of these fans who I think a lot of times like metal kids might be very aggressively sort of mass you know a lot about masculinity and very like you know and he would create this doubt that like maybe this figure that they admired so much was gay yeah. right and he loved to do that because he felt like that unsettled their those viewpoints, and I think he's right. You know, I like think he's it, definitely right. Yeah. So you know that uh, that that's what a lot of that sort of acting uh, and and talking was about. And then yeah, like and also in the in the you know I think that in the '90s, especially or excuse me, in the late '80s, when the country was just recovering from this massive wave. I mean, it took Andrew's life. He died in that wave. Dave Brocky's brother died of of AIDS. Yes, he did. Oh and, my and, god! And he died at you know at the end of that sort of first really big wave of death that moved to the homosexual community and like so he, uh, passed, he passed in the eighties around. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then Mid and then like late. the stigma yeah, that it put on the homosexual community, like right. AIDS was AIDS was a homosexual yeah, problem. Right. It wasn't not. I mean, which obviously we know, of course, AIDS is not just in the homosexual community, but in that time, it seemed like it was more prevalent in that community. Right, and there's and and people, it's definitely true that you know they weren't talking about it, they weren't spending money on it in the way that they are now, and so to have it, the word coming out of Dave's mouth, to have AIDS beer on stage, to have like um, these songs that that talked about it. Um, that was putting it out there so people had to think about it, you know, and that, and, uh, that was intentional. Um, so was there any time you were on stage and Dave Brocky did something that you were like, Oh my God, there's man. a, like, there's holy a, fuck, dude. Like there, there's a, this is hard to get behind. You know, well, this is there, hard to yeah, put <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There is an interview. Um, I mean, excuse me. There's not an interview. What I'm saying there, there's a, a a record that if people have it, um, it, it's the Road Behind EP, and uh, that has a live part on it from this show. And I actually, when I heard it, I remembered the show, and uh, Dave had this little character. It was a little dead rubber eight year old boy that was anatomically correct, and he had been sort of like like he is decomposed. Um, and he had like a head that was empty so he could pull the brain out and he had like a little penis and a little butthole and everything <laughs> oh my and, God. and 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 the, the, that 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 recording captures this very it, it was real brocky was he had the the, the dead rubber 8 year old and he was sucking the the dick of the dead rubber 8 year old <laughs> and so like i say into the microphone as me not as beefcake i'm like stop cut that out man i'm like that's that's just that's just you know stop that like um and uh and it's on the recording <laughs> right and he looks at me and he's like what what you know and so i immediately like snap back and i'm like you shouldn't be doing that like you know 
and he's like this he, he's like this child is this this is he's 18 and I'm like, there's no way that that child is eight. <laughs> and he's like, you know, because it's obviously it's like two and a half feet. Right. Tall. He's right. like a three year old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and this is all taking place with him as odorous. Yeah. 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 And, he, and he goes, no. He's like, it's, it's, well, I'll tell you what. He's it's like, like no, nah, man, this is that band practice. He's man. like, this shit was he, <laughs> he's older than that. He's dead. And that's as old as you can get. And so uh, <laughs> that was his yeah. logic is that? I know. You're like, man, I gotta start keep home. <laughs> right now. Oh man, that keep on show, I can't wait. There were some there were it was more like there was a kind of trend in Guar that, that like at some point I didn't agree with. Uh um and it was never sort of like the message that they were putting out or any single act that we did. Um but uh, uh when I started having objections to Guar, and I did right before I quit, I mean, I, I used that as part of my rationale for quitting, was when it seemed that the fans had stopped understanding what we were doing and they were reacting to it on this level where, uh, like, one thing that Guar was really good at um, is that there were these moments in the show that were terrifying. And what was terrifying about it was that the people liked it. And they were responding to it in a positive way when what we were doing was so horrible. And that, too, was intentional. Um, but there, you know, there over time, uh, I, I get I think that I changed more than Guar changed. Like I started to think, wow, maybe they really don't get it. Like maybe we know these things. But what they see is a woman being pulled to pieces. What they see is like you know this this bad stuff yeah. and, and uh so in my heart i started feeling like like I, I wasn't comfortable with it and that was definitely part of my feeling unsafe it's right? not so much like, that yeah yeah it's, it's like so, when you go to a juggalo gathering you know you just yeah, don't feel yeah. safe no. it's martial law you know because <laughs> you get the joke and you right. understand what it is and you're and as, as as the artist you're not supposed to care if someone else doesn't get it, you're just supposed to do it. Right. But it, when that's like, it's that's easy to say when a ton of motherfuckers aren't there doing something that you're just like, oh man, they don't, they're they're stoked that we're tearing this woman apart. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. I see. I see that. That's weird, I, man. W one thing that happened that was really interesting, man, was like, you know, I talked about people seeing Guar the first time. People had a sense when they saw Guar, and uh, that like it would change like they because it was breaking so many rules the first time like that they saw it they would be like every anything is permissible like if somebody sees these rules being broken it's like a riot like guar had the effect of a riot so it would change people's behavior that were watching it like they would people that would normally like a group mentality yeah almost. they'd suddenly be like oh my god like and start doing crazy stuff you know um and uh, that was that was uh you know, something to behold. What was interesting was when we went to Europe and we played in front of these very political punks um, because we were playing squats. And it was like our first European tour. And I'll never forget the first show, like the first song, like when we took a break, like we played this like three song block and we had killed two things. And we were like, you know, nah, nah, and we stop and we're expecting the roar, right? And what we get is just these concerned looks, <laughs> you know, concerned looks like why are you doing this like you know yeah. and they that was a reaction that i treasured man i loved that because they <laughs> yeah. they challenged us they were like why are you doing this why are you you know i like that you're doing like and we would talk to them afterwards and, and they said you know we like that that it's very creative and we like that you're doing all this stuff but why are you doing what you're doing yeah right and that was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's like How you're being. They, once you explained it to them, were they cool with it? I mean, you know, we didn't really. It wasn't that Give way. Give a fuck. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, at the time, I was like, I, I think maybe I explained it to a couple of them, and and what I noticed was that they had us back. So you know, and I'm th I'm thinking in particular about a squad a, a, a squat in Bielefeld, Germany. Um, that that's the one that I remember, and it's still there. I mean, I, as far as I know, it's still there. It's one of the longest existing squats that there is, um, you know. And they they it keep on play there many times too. Man, that's, so that's fucking great, man. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking forward to getting back on tour with Bar then? 
in uh, a way. I am. I am looking forward to. You know, I'm. I'm working. I'm keeping my job, so I'm going to be working while I'm on the road. Um, which you're is, a professor. No, I mean I am, but I'm. Uh, I'm not working doing that kind of work right now. I'm. I'm working as a. Uh, as a writer, so uh, I can do that from the road and so i'm gonna do that that's while awesome man. yeah and just kind of you know keep working and i'm gonna stop hammering you with questions well i feel like, cool. it's like, it's like, it's been like cool an well, uh, i have a question the, um uh speaking of the future of guar um i had heard that brocky intended on having guar live on forever to the point where he'd have people on deck ready to take over you know just to keep the band alive and do you think mm, well like odorous yeah, no, I mean, well, maybe, <laughs> like but like McDonald's or something. Well, like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> well, I mean, like, There's obviously, like 50 guars. Green Jello is done. Like, uh, well, oh, like yes. obviously, like, Odorous won't be at the guar barbecue, but I mean, do you think what you're doing is the first step into that? I don't know. Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, I have, I have my doubts. Um, only because what what has been most difficult in Guar isn't finding people to stand up there in these costumes. What's been difficult in the band is finding the guys who are into it enough to spend their time making that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, in a way when that goes away, when, when you lose Matt McGuire, when you lose Bobby Gorman, when you lose Don Draculich, when you lose Scott crawl, these are names that some the Guar fans know, but like you know, they don't play any instruments. When those guys go away, Guar will go away. I see. And, okay. uh, and I don't think that, uh, um, you know, I, I don't see there isn't. I haven't seen the new crop of those guys come up yet, and nobody ever has done it like Guar did. You know, partly because I mean, Brocky used to. He would get so angry. I I remember, you know, he he got very angry at Rob Zombie one time because Rob Zombie said. His his reaction to Guar was, I want to do, I will do that, but I want to make money. You know, he was kind of explaining what he did, and he was like, you know, for my performance, like he he was inspired by Guar, but he wanted to make money, and um, that really bugged Brocky a lot. You know, and Guar, you know, it is a metal band right now, but it comes out of of Guar is a very Richmond creation, and it comes out of the the work ethic that musicians and artists from this town have and that they had uh in the 80s um or and in the 90s and uh you know I don't think that it could exist anywhere else I, there are things the things that are most similar to guar you'd be really surprised at what they are the band Leibach is very mm -hmm. similar to guar in the way that it works like you have in that it's an artist collective um and artists move in and out and and Leibach is sort of one element of what they do and they have all these other elements that they do um you know a, a, other things uh i think probably maybe even like pussy riot is kind of yeah, like guar because sure. um it, you know these are things that guar was a, is an art movement and and it is an art movement outside of the commercial realm of art like um you know but somehow has been able to break into commercial parts of it yeah exactly I mean, like like you talk about beavis and butthead yeah you talk about they were on fucking you know jimmy fallon put sure you know? yeah man it, i mean it, eventually it, eventually we, they banged the drum loud enough that 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 everybody noticed but it's like you know but still i mean guar doesn't make the money that slipknot makes guar doesn't make the money that uh, lordy makes they don't make the money that even freaking green jello made you know like um because because they also, especially under Brocky's tutelage, were one of the most obscene acts to ever take the stage. And, like, nobody's going to touch that, right? Like, uh, you know, I mean, there's a story. And I'll tell this story. I, I, I talk a lot, maybe too much. No, nah, it's fine. The, no, it's the, uh, you know, <laughs> Guar, I remember distinctly, There, there's a label called Hollywood Records that's run by Disney. And, um, you know, Disney wasn't all, I mean, they were always sort of a, like an entertainment conglomerate, but they were just sort of starting to feel their wheels in that area. Like, uh, you know, they like Touchstone had come out or whatever sort of uh, other uh, like I, stuff that wasn't kitty. Yeah. It, it was more. Yeah. They were expanding their brand. To an adult audience. Yeah. And this was under like that famous executive that they had who started all that stuff. And that was like in the uh, in the late 80s. 
um, early 90s, and Hollywood Records was a branch of that. And th this is a real story. The other guys will verify it, but it sounds so, so it's incredible. Um, this guy from Hollywood Records saw Guar, and he was like, okay, what's going to happen, man? He, he was like, we want to sign you guys to a, to Hollywood. You know, and Hollywood was basically a major label. Um, you know, at the time there were a lot of independents that had like Bugs Bunny's address. You know, so it's like they were indies, but they were actually run by majors. And and that, and Hollywood was one of those. And and it, this guy was like, you know, really into Guar, and he was like, what I'm going to do? He was a VP, uh, as, as all A and R guys are. <laughs> so he's like, I'm going to I'm going to show you, you know, to to my executive. So we played out in uh, in Los Angeles. And this guy had he he invited these guys from Disney to the oh show. Oh my god! And oh so boy. These, these guys from Disney came to the show and loved it. No, <laughs> <laughs> what happened they was asked if they had dolls for their kids. What <laughs> happened was that the guy came backstage after we were done, and he was white as a ghost. And we were like, "What's wrong?" And he's like, "I got fired. I've been fired." They fired him on the spot. They watched Guar, and they wow. were like, "If you think that this is what we're interested in, then you don't have any place here at all." Had, right. had he seen fired. Guar at all before that? Had he seen it? Yeah. He, yeah, he had seen it. Oh. And he thought, you know, it was his idea to, like, you know, and they fired him on the spot. But wait, wasn't Hollywood Records the same people that did the Insane Clown Posse shit? Probably. I think they signed Insane Clown Posse because I remember when yeah, that. But whole, how late did they sign Insane Clown Posse? Well, I don't I'm sh I'm, I'm just saying that, like, I remember when the whole Insane Clown Posse thing exploded. Yeah. It was because they were under some label that was owned by Disney. Sound, it, rem it sounded, I remember Hollywood Records. When that happened. I mean, I think probably like later on, maybe they changed their tune some, but like at the time, I mean, I also remember that the, there, there were other sort of mitigating circumstances, like the fact that like this was also the time when like Ice-T had come under fire and like, you know, I remember that the, the record that we actually recorded had a song well, well well this toilet earth was it this it might have been america must be destroyed that had a song on it called baby dick fuck that, <laughs> like, that was like and like they didn't want to put it out yeah and, and, and who was they the uh, label it was at the time well that w america must be destroyed was the first time that warner brothers had exercised their option on guar for metal blade like oh, so okay. so we had we had distribution and Warner Brothers was like, you know, we're not gonna <laughs> no. This is like the old realm of fucking recording industry too. Yeah. Like when yeah. albums actually sold and right everything, you know, everyone had options and da -da -da. like no one has when any record, options anymore. Right. When yeah. record labels were run like gangsters, when it's like, yeah, yeah we want to exercise our option. You're like, what the fuck is that? You no, know? no, one, everyone's just like put it on iTunes and get it on Spotify, and who gives a fuck? I feel. You know, I mean, a, a band like Guar to continue would be hard in that just the way how much effort goes into uh, production and all that um, and people making money when there's no album sales behind it. You know, and then the, and then I'm sure Brocky wanted to keep ticket prices low. I mean, fuck, I just paid seventy five dollars a ticket to see Queens of the Stone Age. Ooh. They didn't have the production that Guar has. You know, yeah. I mean, I love Queens of the Stone Age. You put on a great show. But did I walk out of there feeling like. Fuck! I just paid 150 bucks. Definitely, man. You yeah, know, yeah. I never paid. I I think the first time I saw Guar, it was free because yeah. my friend had a ticket. The second time I saw Guar, it was uh like 15 bucks maybe yeah, or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't how know much how much how much control over that do you guys have as far I, as ticket prices? I'll be honest with you, I don't know um anything about that. I mean, when I was in the band, um, I helped Dave run it and. Uh, we didn't care about how much the tickets were. Like we, we wanted them to be as expensive as we could possibly make. Them. <laughs> these are, and, these are all Brad questions. Yeah. But yeah. like, you know, but now I think, yeah, this would be a Brad question, <laughs> yeah. but that was before something changed, like something broke in the concert industry. Like in, in, in other words, like we were like, yeah, man, we can get $15 a show. And that was a lot. Like, you know, something happened and suddenly actually what happened is that, you know, recorded music shit the bed. And so trying to monetize rock and roll, uh, the the only thing that they have is live performance. So you And know, we didn't listen to Pearl Jam, you know? <clears throat> yeah. 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 Nobody listened to Pearl Jam when they started talking about 
you the know. Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster yeah. deal. It was like, you guys are crazy. Yeah. Are like, you a little... Right. Uh, I guess... I, I mean, I, I won't, I'll won't. i ask this question. Fuck it. Are you mad at Brocky for the way he went out? Is that... Uh, I mean, you, I've, when it, when I've it hit, I was kind of shocked. I've gone through the stages of grief about um, what happened with Dave um, in the same way that you would if anybody died. Like, you know, but I mean, I'm not... I'm not angry with Dave for any for any particular reason right. or like the way that he died. I mean, I just um you know, I, I just I'm I'm mad that he's gone because uh and yeah, I mean like if I sit there with Bopes like yeah, you know, Chris Bopes is uh, I mean, I talked about him earlier, but he's a very dear friend and I mean, I would have put my best friends in the world or Chris Bopes and Dave Brocky and um you know I mean they're right up there and uh having him gone out of that equation uh leaves a big hole it, it hurts and uh you know how he died is less important than the fact that he's gone right. and, and that sucks and yeah it doesn't matter how they go you know it's a it's just well a, I mean it, it does and it does and it doesn't but it's like you know I mean uh, it's just it's just unpleasant and it sucks and I just wish that he weren't dead and I I don't want to be <laughs> if I you know I I would do anything and give anything and trade anything for that if you know to have him back and uh, you know be able to hear him talk and sing and be my friend again I think we'll end on that man I think that was a great way to end it. Um, and I, think, on, yeah. I want to say thank you very much, man. You're yeah, Mike, this is this open, has been honest, awesome, dude. honest. One of the most honest interviews I've ever been able to do. It was and it was very yeah. easy and fun. And um, you're welcome back anytime you want to cool, come over man. and hang out. Yeah, dude. I'm sure, like, just so ready yeah. to fucking go. If I get on, you know, if I get on this side of the river, I'm over on the north side usually. Man. Yeah, man. Anytime. Anytime. Dude. Man. Anytime, dude. <laughs> Why don't we just end with some keep on? We'll go. Yeah, I, I, I pulled up some keep on. Uh, Keep on song and a guar tune, and we'll just let that ride out sure. while we get out of here. Do you want to ask anything else, Ryan, or just want to say thank you? And yeah, you, you want to pose yeah, a not Mike as good question? You had, you had a good <laughs> Tyler, here, dude. Ryan at, waits. He like lies and waits, and then he's like, "Wait, I got one really awesome question," <laughs> and that's why he's here. Uh, My, I spent this whole time not listening to anything and just forming it. Yeah, yeah. dude, you're question, just yeah, yeah, you're just over there forming. Like I'm gonna throw out <laughs> the best question ever. Working it like a turd. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Right. I appreciate it, man. Thank All you very much. Right, what what key phone song are you playing? Uh, Thin Solution. No. Oh. It's got some screaming in that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good show. Thanks a lot. All right, man. well, I'm going to kick Thank it, you. man. Cool. Good. All right.